Reserve February 2015. Can you believe it? The year 2015. I remember back in the 70s thinking, oh, one day it's going to be the year 2000. Do you think we'll ever make it to the year 2000? And then we used to calculate how old we were going to be when the year 2000 rolled along. Anyways, we're in 2015. I don't know where the last 20 years went, 30 years. I suppose a lot of us feel that way. Welcome to June. Welcome to the Kruger National Park. And most of all, welcome to our PM Safari this afternoon. My name's Mark. Brian and company are on the back of the vehicle this afternoon, operating the camera. And Andrew is back in FC. Final control. Have the final word. Oh, got look here. There's a lion. Oh, word, just out of the blue. Don't eat me, please. I better stop, otherwise he's gonna chase me. Hello, young lad. We've had a hundred and no, well, 180 degree turn in weather today. We woke up this morning with overcast skies and a drizzle and a rain and cold conditions and that little low pressure has now given way to a super hot high pressure system that here the skies blue blue is a few patches of cloud tiny little patches but it's turned pretty hot February summer hot in fact and I wasn't really expecting to see them like this or him in fact if I go back just a little bit we might be able to see his father this is a young male from local pride oh sorry I'm not saying. the blue sky and the little cloud okay so that this little boy yeah I suppose he's about three and a half I think with the pride but there sitting in the shade of the worry trees at the background just lowered his head and squinting his eyes and summing up which one of us be the tastiest his daddy one of the big males known as timber males I can see an ear twitching on the grasses off to the right too just off just to the right of him Wondering if that might be the female that he's been mating with, if it is the one. Now, some of you might be joining us for the time, or you might not have been with us for very long. But we have spent some time here at Juma, and we've gotten to know some of the characters that live here. You've got to understand that this, although this is a wild area, this is an area of millions of acres of wild African bushveld. This is not a zoo, it's not a safari park, these are not hand-reared cats, these are wild, naturally lion that engage in some of the most aggressive behavior you could ever imagine when they need to. But a lot of the time they accept our presence and as long as we behave ourselves. Although he is kind of looking with a bit of a wry grin on his face. I suppose he's thinking, yeah, we're letting you humans believe that you're comfortable with us and one day it's going to get up and eat you all. But we get to know individual animals. We get to know prides of lion because they have territories and we managed to be lucky enough to drive around this area of bushveld within their territories. We can't quite cover as much ground as they can, so we're very lucky when they come onto our territory or onto our traversing area we're very, very lucky to have them because their territories extend way beyond our boundaries. I'm going to take a little ride around. I'm guessing that most of the pride is spread out amongst all of this low quarry thicket. Fairly short grasses. And a little boy. Peace, bro. Um, I did see a smell with that big male. We were be careful because the 
crowd was around here earlier. And they're not all in the sunshade, so there could be some just here or just there. So it's going to Another hornbill. Giant hornbill that's lying around. They're not going to be too far from each other, so let's take a ride. This quarry bush, see if we can find and count some of the individuals that are, that are here. And then we're going to go off and look for things because on a very hot day like today, these cats are not really going to do anything. Here's a nice profile of that young male we've just been watching. A little bit of a mohawk hairstyle. The way young males are. In Maine, it's just starting to grow. It starts at about, well, it actually starts quite young. If you get to notice it, you get to notice even at about a year. The tufts of hair in the ear is a little bit on the neck. But it's most noticeable around two and a half to three old when you start seeing a little bit more fluff around the neck. And then from three and a half to five, the mane starts filling out. At five, the, the mane becomes identifiable as, a, as, a, as an established adult male. I think be that some of them might have might have gone down into the, the Tamguiti thicket on the other side, the eastern side of that little track we were on called Twin Dance Road. I can see there is a belly. Here's the big daddy, big male. He's turned around. He's so far looking at it, he's not frowning yet, his ears aren't back, his ears are still forward. Well you're not going to try our luck too much. He's certainly turned around. He's been watching our every move. Could be because he's mating and he's a bit protective over his female. Hello, Mr. Lion. Hello, Diane in Michigan. Something about snails that have turned up in Cuba that carry a parasite that is linked to meningitis in humans. I haven't heard anything in that line, Diane, but I'm not too clued up on that kind of thing. Some really beautiful moments of the sunlight coming through and just touching his face. He's a magnificent lion, this. He's one of two brothers that dominate in this area. There's a rather strange phenomenon of large groups of males we call coalitions. Although we name the pride when there is a coalition of males, when there's a group of males, we give that group of males a name even though they are connected to a pride. This pride of lion is known as the Nkuhuma pride, N-K-U-H-U-M-A, no, yeah, something like that, N-K-U-H-U-A. Too hot to bother. I'm not a threat. I'm just here to say hello and to see you and to show you to the world, Mr. Lion. I'm just going to move around a little bit now that you're lying down and at peace with the world. You're not going to come eat me.
either it's too hot or oh, there's, see in the deep shade of that quarry over there at least two or three other lion rather whether they I'm not sure I'm guessing it's probably the one female that is an estrus that's being mated with at the moment but my plan was just to come and ascertain here's another one just in this shade of this quarry now if you didn't know in fact I didn't know that they were here I'm just discovering them they were in the area in the vicinity this morning but it, of course morning shade and afternoon shade are different so they might move into the morning shade and by the time the afternoon comes along where they were in the morning they have to move and sometimes they change trees completely so it's going to be a hot afternoon we've got at least two and a half hours ahead of us to go and do other things before these cats are even going to think about doing anything and since they are so close to Juma Warhol or Gowrie Dam the dam close by um, Hope, guessing, hoping that they're going to want to go for a drink when it starts cooling down. Here we can see just flat, what we call flat cats. Carpets of cats, they're, they're all lying in the shade. They're barely lifting their heads because they, well, some of them are just sort of turning their ears and lifting their heads, but we're going to leave them be and, uh, and find some wonderful because of this African bushveld for you in the interim and we'll come back here and they'll start getting active maybe we can drink they might even go hunting we might miss it I've, I've, I've been on hot days like this I've been with lion and thinking hey little boy goodbye little boy thinking that well we're just sleeping lion and we'll go and do other things and within a few minutes of me leaving, they killed this very same pride, funny enough. In a few minutes, this is some buffalo walked into them and they jumped up and brought down one of the buffalo and killed it. So, these things can happen. If wildebeest, kudu, zebra, something, anything is coming along here to go to the dam for a, an afternoon drink, they're so well concealed that they could go into hunt mode in, in an instant. And they'd probably have enough energy and they'd probably have enough uh, of a surprise attack to be successful. But we're not going to sit here in the sun on and in case that might happen. We need to go and find some other character to look at. Questions at wildearth.tv back in FC, be a flicker of your footage. What a lovely day. I believe we were having a bit of a choppy stream and that maybe things weren't running as smoothly as they could have, should have. Hopefully things are better now.
John in Connecticut. Hello. Question of the off first question of the afternoon. Come on, know how long before these two males, these two big boys, push that young male out of the pride? Um probably any day now. It's gonna happen soon. Um, within the next months. But it might not be, it might not it might not transpire that the two big males are actually gonna physically push him out. It might be that there's gonna be turmoil amongst the the ruling mills of the area. And as a result, in the ensued chaos, he's going to have to probably run for his life. Uh, just have a look quickly at this pond. I mean, unfortunately, it's getting a little bit choked now, but this is a plant. I was asked this morning to have a look at some of the, the aquatic plants that we get around one of them. Oh, there's a birdless cuckoo we'll just flew into the back there. Sadly, it disappeared into the thicket. A floating plant known as Ludwigia that we find at most of the water holes in this. Tiny little yellow flowers that has roots that don't break root in soil. Oh, look, there's a canary. A couple of canaries coming down to drink. Just here at the mud. Used to be known as yellow-eyed canaries. I don't think we can try and... I don't think you see how little yellow they are. They're like lemon yellow rather than canary yellow. Third one. Also known as serens. Something, something frightened them before they even drank. These little birds are service when they come and drink. That if there was a lot of vegetation next to the water, they would. Probably. But this is the, the only little place they can get to. And I guess maybe if I if I found a dead twig to put there but they get so nervous because there are a number of raptors, small raptors, corks, small owls and things that are likely to come and grab them when they're out in the open like that. So vulnerable when they drink as it is the low mammals when they drink very vulnerable for that they are at such risk of being preyed on bending down to drink water. Nice little spot to sit at for a while if we wanted to do some birding. We'd probably get wax balls and fire finches and melba finches and what else? Starling. The canaries were there, probably other seed eaters, some of the sparrows, some of the mannequins, maybe the tits. So John, in Connecticut, sorry, interrupted, as I'm always interrupted. Ah, that cuckoo mm. flying in circles, it just landed, and almost flew right past it, so I don't know if we're going to stay there, but is an interesting cuckoo and worth trying to catch if it stays there and it's not going oh, oh it's even better on the lower branch on that marula now very difficult to ID at this distance maybe
Not really, it's got mostly a yellow beak. And that's the diagnostic. You can't see it, but just looking through the binoculars, it's got the yellow around the eye and all, all the nesties. There are only two cuckoos that look like this. But... The difference is so subtle. Very hard to tell the difference from this kind of distance. But I'll show you. Let's get out the book quickly. Get to my index. Quick reference index, if it even helps. Um, cuckoos, where are the cuckoos? They are somewhere. Owls, hoopoos, honey guides. I'm trying to look too fast, I'm missing everything. Let's just go to I used to know the pages of all the birds in a, in a different book. I used to be able to hand my bird book over to them and say, Oh, that bird is on page 131. So, the what is known as the common or the European cuckoo has got mainly a black but it is very, very, very similar to the African cuckoo, which has got mostly a sort of yellow base to the bull. And that one's got a very definite yellow base to the bull. The, uh, of course, the only thing it could be anything close to is the, uh, the, the lesser cuckoo, but we don't get the lesser cuckoo here. It only sort of really occurs much further north or down on the coast. So this time can be definite, and it is an African But between the two, the African and the European, they are the cuckoos of all. And so you only really see them in flight, and it's, it's probably mostly the African, but we're not nice. able to stop and get a close enough look to confirm that it's not an, a, a European, because I suppose there are not that many European cuckoos that can find their way here. I don't know, I'm guessing. I don't see too many of them. The thing is that they, the European cuckoos are silent, the African cuckoos are not, and most of the time they're not calling anyway. Right, so I was talking about lion, wasn't I? I think so. I think so. That, well, we're going to have to wait and see what happens. We've got this unique situation where this area, this part of the northern Sabi sand, going into Manuleti, there are mostly coalitions of males. And there is probably no way on earth that a still male lion growing up in this area. There goes a fairly large heap. Looks like the Wahlbergs from here. Uh, flying right into sun. Sorry to disturb Eagle. For a single lion to try and make it in a world with the coalitions rule territories, it's almost it it, it it seems impossible that it can work because There is a coalition of five slightly older, maybe they're about a year older than him. Do you want some help with that? Yeah. Better known as the Birmingham boys. They've already had a run-in with these two males known as the Matembas. Um, they've been around, in fact, it looks like they've gone further south, but they were here, there are tracks of them going south. It looks like they were up here when these lion killed a couple of 
couple of nights ago. Interesting footprint there. Let's go down to the dam to see if we can find out. So they, these are five up-and-coming young males that are about a year older than this young male from the Inkahumas. They're these two Matembas that are probably in their prime and if they're his father, then they've probably been ruling this area for well over three and a half, maybe four years, uh, which means that they're kind of on their way out soon. Um, there are the two big Salati males from up north. There's the Mchingi lines that come in from the west. So where is a little boy to go where he doesn't have, have a bunch of brothers to back him up? It's kind of hard. Uh, we think our gangland wars are pretty harsh. Come to Darby Sand and see what happens in the lion population here because this is brutal. Only three days ago, those young Matimbas that had that are, are normally, or rather not Matimbas, Birmingham males, those young Birmingham males that are normally sort of further to the west and the south of us, came up this way and actually killed one of the lionesses of the pride that had just seen. So there are turf wars here that can rival any gang like turf war. And consequences are probably just as, as, as brutal, if not worse. Um, here in this part of the world, New males coming into territory will kill young cubs. They'll kill females. They'll cause ever. So, amongst all of this turmoil, this young male, one of these days, is actually going to run for his life. Unless he gets killed. And it's almost an inevitability. And he might have to go and set up shops somewhere far. The interesting thing, though, however, is that we have seen from previous experiences that they don't have to be related males to hook up together to become a coalition. And he might just collude with uh, Define his nomadic travels. He's got another couple of years of being nomadic. He can't, there's no way at his age that he could hope to to overthrow anyone in this area in terms of, of, of establishing territory. Or maybe, no, this is good from here. I think part because the buff, the, the lion are at Gari Dam, and there's a lot of buffalo here at Treehouse Dam, but then there's always buffalo here at Treehouse Dam. Any. Any do you mistake? Jackson and Aubrey come in. Okay, Tex copied. Um Nyari and the Nyoni at three us there. Yeah, they're still Lalapanzi because this morning and all that quarry on the uh, western side of Twin Dan's Road. Hello, Mario, in the Netherlands. 
I was lucky enough to meet Mario last year. She came to spend some time with us here in South Africa. Spent some time with Tara at Project. Actually, Mario's done it a few times. And spent some time with myself and friends. Just outside the Greater Kruger. I forgot the question. My job, I'm sorry. I'm sitting here looking at these buffalo and things, and I'm thinking, I had the answer in my head to what you were asking. My job asked the question, and now, having spoken to Tex, I know that looks like a scrotal hernia to me. And this has got a big set of testicles. That's a lot of bull. It's a very big bull. Look at that. I love the way when they stretch and they, oh, when they stretch and stretch the muscle in their head. Just listening to the radio, sorry. I can turn it down now, they're talking nonsense. Andrew, you're asking from the Netherlands. Sorry, Marjo. Do you know, you all know by now that. Oh, the news, Terry, about zebra stripes. Hmm. Oh, there, there, there have been a lot of theories about zebra stripes. But yet, yeah, evidently, the new theory is that it protects the against biting flies because somehow um, it, it, it just shortly a short while ago there was this new theory that the black and the white created these thermal little thermal whirls around a zebra's body with the black attracting and the white reflecting it that that was one reason why they were striped and then I mean they, I remember Years ago, learning that they're striped like that to dazzle predators, and every now and then these new theories arise. You know what? I don't think that we'll even know a fraction of what it is. why zebras are striped, that we're still learning about this. So, yes, it is all about when zebra are running away from predators and they're all in one group. That's hard for a predator to identify one, it's harder for them to single out an individual. Um, but I don't think we can think that predators are that silly. Um, the fact that the zebra stripes, black and white, the way they are, help with thermoregulation of the body, being the kind of horses that are. Well, they do sweat and they do. Could be that that's part of it as well. And the new theory about biting flies and things, and they seem to have found that. Um, with the stripes, I suppose, simulated tests that maybe the stripes attract less flies than just a single arctic. But if it was the case, why aren't buffalo striped? I mean, buffalo probably suffer most insect infestations that you could imagine just because they're all part of the reason they lie in the water. You know, I've seen buffalo lie in the water where they are so inundated with clouds of these tiny little biting flies. They even put tire faces, they hold 
and they put their faces on water to get away from them. I suppose one day they'll even start looking like hippo. Evolution takes its... But it can't be the only reason why zebra have stripes, otherwise so many other animals would have stripes because everything is attacked by and, and biting insects. So sure, I'll buy it from the scientists, I'll buy it that there's... It, 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 it helps, but that's not the entire reason why zebra have stripes. If you know what I mean. We've all got to, everything that we, we learn about can only be really a fraction of what it really is because I'd say that 90% of what we witness with animals is all behavioral and none of that can be written in a book and none of that can be sort of put down as a textbook case of what happened because they're thinking, breathing, living beings. They're, they're, they're not automated, unfeeling, robotic animals. Creatures, they've got red blood beat veins, they've got a heart beat, they've got a brain, they've got feeling, they've, there is... And if we look at animal instinct, for example, There's maternal instinct. There is there are strong maternal feelings in things like spiders and scorpions, and um, parental care. Well, these things extend to fish and the reptiles, and for far too long, we as humans have put ourselves on a pedestal as the only ones that can feel and do all of that. Just because I think other creatures don't have the language, the vocabulary and the language to communicate that we do. We think that communication is the key to in intelligence and things. It's not. Um, there is so much more to life than just being able to make up a language and write a dictionary. Why are they? They're all looking to the west. We're going to move along. These off. I see there is a sister there, actually. Not that very young one, but there is a younger buffalo there sitting right amongst more. I don't know if it might be a not be a male, maybe. back and see something. Hello Marianne in Texas. In all my travels in Africa have I ever had the chance to see gorillas? Unfortunately not. Man. Um, gorillas, or oh, the whole gorilla experience up in well, Central Africa is so expensive. I, mean, I think just your, just your entrance fees are something like $750 a day just to get into the park. And not to mention all the flights and everything. I don't think that it would ever be possible for me to see gorillas unless I go and work up there somewhere maybe. Hello, Kudu. These are our Kudu bulls and a bachelor herd of Impala, too. Seems words got out that the lion around Gauri Dam, so a lot of animals at Gauri are down here at Treehouse. I guess you can pretty much count out being a little in the area. 
Sorry, Cooter Bulls. I'll disturb you a little bit. I would love to see Kudu. I'm Kudu. I'm seeing Kudu right now. Gorillas, I mean. Hello, boys. He's gonna be left, so we'll give him a miss. Two of the bulls, or two bulls, I don't know if they are two of the two bulls, two of the bulls that we normally see. There might be other bulls coming into the area. And yeah, because you're hiding, doesn't mean I can't see you. You're like an ostrich with your head in the sand. You've got a big body, Mr. Kudu, so I might not see your face, but I can can see all of the rest of you. I don't think we've been this close to could before. When he bends his head down, when he when he low down to go through the bush, you'll notice that the top curve of the tusk, the tusk actually curls around the nucleus. And I've seen kudu lay their horn along their back. That matches almost the curve of the neck and then the nuchal muscle, so that the one horn lies along the ridge of the neck and the nuchal muscle, and the other horn actually is used to brush the bush away from them so they can walk through thick bush. There's a frame, there's a natural frame. A wooden frame. Sometimes it becomes a competition because there might be other big herbivores, other big pachyderms that also want to lie in the mud. Sometimes there's not enough space. I think as long as there's space and as long as they can all have their own personal space on them, they're pretty amicable. But it's when water starts shrinking and when the mud starts drying up that it becomes or that tempers start flaring, and then you start having a little bit of uh, uh, conflict between things like hippo and buffalo and elephant and rhino. Okay, time to move. We're going to do a tour of the desk today because it's a hot day and it seems there's a fair amount of activity around it. Time to, little, to roll along. Bye boys, it's the narrow horn could be the other one that was here. Very narrow horn. My hope is that it's going to be something big and grey around one of these dams somewhere. An appropriate question, I suppose. Uh, I, I, it'd be nice to actually somehow record the the incidents. 
a little better. Sharon's saying, how is it that when we've got lions in area, we don't see leopards so much? Um, maybe because we spend so much time watching the lion that we're not looking for leopards. That might be one reason. There were there were there were leopard tracks today. In fact, uh, not far from where we are now, came onto the property. They walked down from Twin Dims Road and then started coming west a little bit. And then it looks like the, this leopard finally finally went north. Found some tracks from Zoe's Road this morning. There is the other side of it that most likely, quite possibly, most likely, especially since these cats have been so vocal, that it's a good possibility that the leopard have been hearing them and they're trying to avoid the area where the lion are. No, it wants to be caught by big tawnies. But it would be interesting to, to try and document that. Sherry on Twitter wants to know what happened to the wildebeest's horn? Brian's mom. The wildebeest that was killed by these lions. Um, they are in a safe place, Sherry. Because of the the nature of that, that, that wildebeest, because of the nature of the, 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 the broken horn, I felt it important for educational and for knowledge purposes to make sure that that skull was available to us. Okay, well that's for a flower. I wanted to make sure that that skull was available to us to have a look at post-mortem and Try and learn something about what it is that, that created that deformity or the, uh, something. I want you to look into it further. It's a rather unique situation. Now, um, there, were, there wasn't very much left of the carcass yesterday after the fact there was very little after the vault had been there. It looks like hyena had come past there the night, but they didn't even really do anything. But if, I, I must go back a step before the hyena, in fact. At the end of drive last night, I made a decision that for interest's sake, I needed to protect that skull from being taken anywhere by hyena so that we would never see it again. If it was any other wildebeest skull, To you all, to, uh, if it doesn't sound too terrible to most of your viewers, but I think just from a point of view of learning, a point of view of, of this is an opportunity to see some that we've never seen before, uh, and, and in particular because we held her in such high regard, we, she 
was such an uh, an iconic wildebeest. So we're going to need to give it a week or so, and then hopefully we can I'll be able to do it like a show and tell next time it rains. Two weeks time, full moon when it rains. We'll do a show and tell, and we'll have a look at that whole horn entry and how that is how she must have. She must have to live with that for most of her entire adult life, giving birth to cars. Plus we'll have a look at the teeth. Um, I should actually go back there and see if I can have a jaw, come to think of it. That back actually this is important as saving the skull. Very often I've actually been able to have a jaw because of an anomaly on the skull that is important for me to show up further on. It's that warthog skull that had abscess in its tooth and I'm guessing that as a youngster a son or something got to a, 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 one of its, its, its into its gum in, uh, into the poop. Uh, that tea came out and it eventually grew and they grew with it lived with this abscess on its jaw but how the entire jaw structure and and dental structure changed because of this absence. A friend of mine has the lower jaw of an elephant. I'm hoping that I can see it the next time I go and leave. I'm sure he might have cleaned it by now. That also has an incredible formation in it. This must have been in pain for most of his life. And he was one of the nicest elephants we knew up in the Timberwati. But he died. Um, so from a point of view of learning about how things, when I talk to you, some of the things that I can talk to you about, I can tell you about, because I, it's this first knowledge of being inquisitive and wanting to find answers and having the time and the patience to wait for things like skulls dry out or the luck. So that's what I've done with the skull of the wildebeest. Hello, Heron and Buffalo. This is the west side of the dam. Maybe we won't, yeah, won't disturb the heron who's doing some frogging and fishing. The most hey there, Heron. Betty in Virginia. Betty wants to know if I carry in any protection in case I'm attacked by any of the animals. Yeah. Pulling in protection most of the time. My experience with Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. Experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Normally we have a fairly good signal here in this riverbed. We've been in the riverbed for the last few minutes and obviously I've got to get to a better signal area. Um, 
been some interesting holes being dug by elephant further back and some fairly fresh tracks. There's a family of Nyala that we're here now and they're just moving off sadly. But we're gonna maybe continue to see if we can find more sign of these alleys that we're here and also wanna maybe get up to because of dam. These elephants would look like they were sort of heading north towards the north. So It doesn't look like they were being very successful digging for water here in the riverbed. There was some wet sand and there was some evidence that they might have done some, might have been successful. So just the elephant tracking every which other way, but I'm hoping that there might be some alleys around the Fizzle Dam. Lilac breasted roller, probably one of our prettiest birds, most colourful you'll see here in South Africa. There are others, but they're not as common as the lilac breasted roller. There are some other birds that are most beautifully coloured birds. I was asked about the car carmine bee eaters this morning, I think it was just in Australia. And um, there is the Nerina trogon. Bird I've never seen is not the Angolan Pitta, P I T T A. Pitta. Spent time in the Low Zambezi Valley looking for them, didn't manage to find one. But there the day before I arrived, the two weeks I was there, there wasn't one to be seen. Story of our lives, isn't it? That which one wants the most, one is bound to find. Hard. Kathy, have I ever seen a shoeful stalk and have they ever seen in the Sabi sand? Kathy, no. I've never seen a shoeful stalk. And although I lived in the Okavango Delta and there are maybe a handful of reports of shoeful stalks, maybe up in the Cylinder Spillway, somewhere up there in the Delta Marsh region, some questionable reports of shoeful stalks being there, but really shoeful stalks are in a tiny little patch of Africa that is about as it's probably smaller than New York City with throughout the whole of Africa that's the only place you'll find shoeful stores. They are quite remarkable birds. I don't even I couldn't even imagine how big they 
are. I'm getting like quite tall, but I've only ever seen Shubal stalk in the photo. Get a question and then the radio goes and then my mind goes on swing. And it's not because I'm trying to avoid questions or anything. It's just the timing. It's just so weird. And how something just phew, slip out of my mind. They are very, very particular in their habitat. No, saddle or shubal? Right, we've got saddles here, but shubles rather an unusual bird. <laughs> yes, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Andrew. I remember the art shubles for uh, this rough getting really bumpy. No wonder nobody really uses it anymore. We used to use this road a lot. This is Batelier Road. Goodness sakes. Somebody else asked me about Shubal Stork, and then I remember I found something that had a picture of a Shubal Stork. I thought it was Seth. I sent it to Sarah. Sarah didn't know what I was talking about. I had to explain it. But they're quite remarkable birds. And I think there's, you've probably got a better chance of seeing be careful how, how I choose my words now. But a better chance of seeing a striped hyena than a shubal stalk. Once again, oh look zebra! They have some specific habitat type, they like marshy areas up in Malawi, Zambia. And okay, this is a zebra roadblock, not a zebra crossing. Of stalks, there was a woolly neck stalk at Gary Dam. Actually, it's also just known as the African Shubal. Not even featured in our Southern Africa, and the book is the Southern African sub-region, which I would imagine includes Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, and Swaziland, and in Lutu, those countries. Hello horses!
Look at the difference between these two zebra. Such a marked difference. I think they're both stallions, to be honest. Well, I, I did. I thought I saw a foal. But the density of the shaft of this facing, and that almost lack of shadow straight boy at the back there, how different they And this one has got shadows all the way up through to the shoulder. Very unusual to have shadow stripes. So, oh, he's got a bad leg. Uh, that back right is, as you can see, he's not putting any weight on it. Beautiful colour this zebra. I'm gonna go forward. Just past these little cluster leaves. You can see that boy at the back there had a, got a couple of lion scars on his rump where he's been attacked before. And he's ripe. Go ahead, Tex. I negative left there quite a while ago. Yeah, that big my daughter. And lot of now. I think his name's Londa Lozi. A little bit of weight on it. Could maybe as a thorn in the hoof or he actually I think it might be a mare, come to think of it. Need to look carefully. Let's see if I can see. Almost got the pinkish hit to the zebra. Really pretty zebra. Let's see if I can see anything. Oh, just not enough time. That is a mare. It's looking at you. She's a little bit swollen down on the hock. Maybe it's a pooled muscle or something. I can see there's a... This, I don't know whether it's... Mud or something along her entire... From her ankle down. Hello, little boy. Is that your mother? He's not really an adult stallion. He's just a little boy. I'm guessing that's mom. Also a pretty zebra. Lovely sheen in this light. Maybe a twisted ankle or something. Sprained muscle, maybe a thorn. He's had a good, good scratch taken out of him. Couple of scratches.
Sarah, California. Sarah's asking about Sipiwe. Funny enough, I, I, I was in Utah in the other day, and because I had to come to work, I, I didn't have much time to stop by, but I did stop by to see Joel, who owns the general store, and who, I think he's even a relative of Sipiwe. Um, I did ask after her, and I am hoping that maybe even next week when we have to go and get fuel for the vehicles, maybe I can go here. I think she's doing fine. Um, Ariel is the name of her daughter. She had a daughter when she was doing our directing. Sipi was the director here at Wild Earth. She lives in the village of Utah, just outside of Dixie. And uh, I've seen her for a while, but I believe she's doing okay. But I will go and meet up with Sarah. Make a point of it. Okay, don't mind, so then I'm, I'm going to go look for an elephant, but I'm happy to sit with you. I don't mind if you want to just walk in the road instead of cross the road. I can understand why she wants to walk in the road. If she's got a little bit of a, an injury in her foot, then it's flatter and calmer to walk on the road rather than the unevenness off-road. Sounded just like a horse there. But a fright. It was a horn bull that flew and gave the zebra a fright. I guess he wasn't expecting that flash of black and white in the wing, the wings and the feathers. Okay, so what I think we'll do is since they're heading down the road, Drakensburg Drive, like this, uh, we're going to be heading north. Well, I think we'll just do a detour. We'll go up to Ch Cheetah Cut Line. I don't want to appear to be pushing them. I know they're just walking that way anyway. And it looks like she wants to meet up with me. The rest of the herd has moved on that way. By the time we come down at Gwari Pan, in fact, you'll probably see them approaching Gwari Pan. But the late they going, they might even beat us there because we've got to go up and then along and then down again. But I don't want to, especially with her injury, I don't want to force her. I want to push her. they'll still be around for another week or two only leaving sometime in March
Sarah. And Virginia. Hello, Sarah. I'm um, wanting to know if these predators make more of a target of those individuals that are limping or injured. Uh, I guess to some extent. Oh, wow. Big male giraffe tracks. We might find him on that way. Been walking on the road quite recently, in fact. be here somewhere. Quite often at night when predators are hunting they might pick up on an injured, an injured individual and they might talk that injured individual. Um, however sometimes when they are hunting at night there's a big kudu running across the road. He's definitely not one of our friendly kudu. What on earth was that? Just a stick. Got attacked by a stick. I think when you look at when you look at maybe injured predators. predators, full function, they're the ones that are going to be depending on the slower prey species. The I'm still dragging the stick that's making the noise. Maybe reversing will get rid of it. Second boss maybe not. walking on the road. Big bull to run. But when predators are going for their prey at night or when they're hunting, that I, I guess sometimes they, they go for individuals, but generally they go for the individual that is the easiest, the easiest target at that moment. So you might get a very healthy individual. I mean, for example, um, the male impala that is standing aside from all his females, he's the one that's going to be the target. There might be an injured female, she might even have a broken leg, there might be a car or a okay, impala that lands, but there might be youngsters that are easy targets. But It is going to slow her down and she is going to become a target, there's no two ways about it, whether it's a healthy predator or a predator that's having a little bit of a problem with hunting at the moment. Uh, even a healthy predator who hasn't hunted well, that's likely to be low on energy. Hello little Mrs. Kudu. Do you see a big giraffe? Come by here. A tall handsome fella, tall dark and some. You didn't? Uh, I guess you weren't looking at that. Wrong species. Okay. I get it. But he's not on... He has been walking on the road now. So he's either there or there.
Hello, Laura. Laura's in Biloxi. Isn't that not in Mississippi? Laura wants to know if they can be tamed. To ride like they can be tamed, or they can be reared to accept human companionship. They can be uh, habituated, they, but they cannot be ridden. They have very weak backs. They also just have a different shape of body that doesn't make it practical to ride zebra. But also they just wouldn't know what to do. I don't think you could break a zebra in the way you break a horse in and then teach it about a bridle and saddle and reins. And I, I, I think they've tried times. They, they've even tried spanning zebra in like uh, a wagon, a wagon team. But it's just the tendency of the zebra to want to go their own ways. They have to just follow each other like sheep. Domestication takes generations and generations, if not thousands of years, hundreds of years. So I believe it's been tried. And I know that there are people that have hand reared zebra, but even though they are hand reared, they don't take on the traits that horses do that uh, allow that, that have that kind of tolerance. Well, I guess we didn't find our giraffe yet. We must move on to port, or maybe he also went down towards Biffles of Dam. Track-wise, we've got... Oh, I didn't know any but there, those are dog tracks. East. Yeah. Two, three, four... That's why we haven't found them, because they must have turned around and headed east yesterday. Another one there. Very nice dog over there. Oh, there. That's quite fresh, actually. because it would be nice to know if they can find them. Any station on Torchwood? Okay. Uh, sorry, repeat that. Yeah, Andrew, there's my Dutch and Corns are heading east from uh, Buffalo's of Gary Klein and Cheetah Cut Line. Okay, copy, thanks. Yeah, there's some cones of one big Madoda heading north on Cutland, but that is crossed. I'll check around uh, Bafuzuk Dam. So, interesting that Andrew's already on these tracks in Torchwood, but here we go after a two days. No wonder I couldn't find anything anywhere on Juma because they turned around and they came back east. Sick track here. But, uh, tracks are actually up and down. I'm wondering if we might not have been here early this morning and seen them somewhere. But these tracks are from today, coming up before the cut line and heading east into Torchwood. Hmm. either going east or north.
Hello, BJ. Fruit trees. Well, interesting question about fruit trees. Talking about peaches and pears and apples and all the common fruit that we all know about. Um, obviously, these are all fruits that don't occur in Africa, so none of those trees occur in the Sahabi. There are a lot of... I think almost every household in suburbia in South Africa has a peach tree or an apricot or a pear tree or something um, planted, brought in wherever they came from. We have a very large fruit industry in this country, very large. Um, in fact, these dogs have been eating, in fact they were eating yesterday, there's dung here, oh smelly. That's very rich in blood and very wet. So we missed them. We missed them. We were looking. We all we just we, we assumed since they were in west, we went west and we looked for the west and come and started all over from the beginning from the east again. But who would have known? Um, BJ, are there fruit trees in Kruger that humans regularly eat? I think the biggest and the most common is the marula fruit. Um, there are other fruits that are edible and even palatable that are quite nice, but the, the amount of flesh around the seed is, is small. That you almost need a whole handful to put in your mouth, and then the skin isn't very palatable, so for us humans, so they're practical fruits to eat. You can't eat one at a time. You can't take one and then peel it, because You would need a hundred fruits just to get the amount of fruit of a, a hundred seeds rather, to get the amount of fruit as one raisin. And funny enough, called raisin bush. Um, buffalo thorn is very similar. It's got a very dry skin to it and there's a little bit of flesh but a very big nut. A lot of the fruits are palatable and they are edible, edible and they might even have some vitamin C content. The marula is probably about the most common. Uh, a couple of months ago we had the sour plums that were fruiting and they are quite a fleshy fruit. But as the name implies, sour plums are very high in vitamin C and they are, they can be very sour. Jackalopes are edible, but they're not really that palatable. You've got to remember that everything here is going to be carrying larva of insects. Nobody sprays here for parasites and insects. And things. So any fruit that you eat here is most likely going to have some insect in it. Nothing that is a commercial... The only, the only fruit that is used commercially that grows here is the marula fruit. They are grown uh, up north near Palabora and of course that's how they make the Amarula cream liqueur and other liqueurs and they are used to create jams and preserves and a fruit juice, uh, a refreshing fruit juice and obviously they are, are, are treated properly for any internal parasites. But there is nothing else that grows here that one could harvest or commercially it becomes a viable commercially viable fruit because of it, its its dense pulp like an apple link. Taken up pretty time getting here to Buffalo Lamb. The elephant that was here is probably long gone. We might have to try and find him unless he decided to come to the water. And he's at the water. dog tracks. Okay, we'll go back there then. We can do that. Not impossible. We're not here anymore to see the wild dog tracks, but we can go back. 
that's easy enough. We've got to go that way anyway. Well, not that way, but we've got to get back onto the boundary anyway. Let's see what we can see up first around the Puzzle Dam, because I'm hoping there's a packet of Let there be a pachyderm, an elephant, preferably. Nice. At one point where the well, dog tracks are, there is a set of hyena tracks. It's quite a nice comparison. Because they're the only two that look alike, but the size is just so different. That wild dog can't, can't even be a young hyena, it's just so different. Hello, everybody. It's a hippo. I forget this branch break somewhere. Andrew, come in. Summer's afternoon in a waterhole in Kruger Park. Quite often, actually, you know, one of the nice things to do when you're driving yourself, or if you do a trip in Kruger, is to just get to one of these waterholes and you stop and you switch off and sit and listen. And if you've got a couple of hours to kill, sometimes it's better than driving because sometimes you get to see more that come down. I don't know where that hippo would be underwater. Yes. One hippo there on the top end.
I had to take some books away while we are just carry on. Andrew, come in. Andrew, come in. Busy. Unless it's a flat cat or something, but when it's an elephant, or as the case the other day, the wild dog. If you're not there when they are there, then you lose them. As they say in the classics, you snooze, you lose. Walala wasala. Looks like the elephant might have come this way. That breeding, no, not. I think generally, Marianne, animals that have an irregular number of months of gestation don't have a season. Animals that have a. Oh, I can see. His track was dry. Too. Hippo's gestation is about nine months, as far as I know. And so it, it didn't really lend itself towards having a season. So any time of the year is good. Now I know that the, the, the dog tracks are up there at the cut line, it beats cheetah cut line. Maybe we'll see where they came back onto the road. Around here somewhere. Maybe they just, they didn't even touch on Juma again.
beauty up on the road. What we need is there's a lot of shade on the road here, and although there are dog tracks here, I need to be up there where the kudu is, where there's sunshine. But you're not going. I'm not going to be able to get any texture or any any any. Well, texture, I guess, is the right word uh, on the, on the substrate to be able to show you tracks without the sunshine. And we still got to turn around for it too. And I don't want to be driving over any track. Find some really nice clear ones. Which I know are further up there. Hello, Mrs. Kudu. before I do this, I just want to talk on the radio. Andrew, come in. Yeah, that Lamiti crossed Bifuzuk cut line just north of Bifuzuk Dam. Uh, which way that Nlov that, Nlo that was Bifuzuk Dam, which way was he moving? Yellow Road. Okay, so maybe in that 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 drainage line of Nyala Road. Okay, thanks. So let's see. The best track we can look at is probably going to be. Are you on Kudu? Yeah, I was. Till they saw me and ran away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, where are we looking? Maybe here? Good. There's another small one. I'm going to use this marula nut as scale. This is a marula nut. One, two, maybe three marula nuts. Can you get this close? No, I just can't see that one. Okay. Um, we'll go a little bit further. We've got to go up to the junction anyway, because we're going to be going around fast where we can. Oh, there's even dung. I must look for that little spot dash that I saw earlier. Well, maybe we passed it already. Where there was very bloody dung. My piece in, but just a sec before I do. Yeah, oh, see, there's nothing here now. Maybe we'll see something, a little bit of dappled black of his. See that track over there? This one. You can see that one. Marula nut next to a hyena track. You can see the hyena track is probably at least three times bigger than a wild track. Now, let me just go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
get some nice one fresh. thing about these dogs is they were trotting when they came past here they were actually trotting they weren't walking so they splashed a little bit of sand which makes the track a bit bigger which one are you on this one the next one that one yeah once again with the marula nut so much smaller than the hyena track but much much more compact rated than a hyena track a hyena track is a lot broader but the one very distinctive feature of the dog track and maybe I'll have to bring out the book to show you is the fact that at the back of the pad are two lobes same as the hyena as opposed to the cat which have three lobes This is a very, very special marula nut because it's got four chambers. This is the nut, the stone, the marula. We're going to be seeing some of these now because fruits are finished, almost finished. We've still got some really nice big fruits falling at camp now. And some of those have probably got nice big stones like this. This is covered in flesh, juicy flesh that's really, really tasty, that has a leathery skin. And it's normally closed up completely, but they're like a coconut. They're these eyes. And ordinarily, you will only ever get three and this is about as rare as a four-leaf clover because normally you'll only get three chambers in a nut sometimes only two which gives you the eyes of each <laughs> comedy of errors like the eyes of each but what I want to do for you to you. What I want to do for you soon is find some nuts and take a knife and pop these eyes out and then also just tap out the nuts. The most nutrition, protein full, delicious things. Hello, lizard. Dash to cross the road. Okay, we've got a date with some animals. Off we go. Very special maroon nut. Who is that? I lost my little. This is zebra wood that was here just before drive. Oh, it seems to just disappear. Oh, if I can get this earpiece to stay right here and not get caught in my hair. I love it.
Good afternoon, Kenneth. Very nice to meet you. Kenneth is asking what I did before Wild Earth and what I've, how long I've been with Wild Earth. Um, gosh, what did I do before? Before Wild Earth, well, let's start with the other question. I started with Wild Earth six years ago. And in the last six years, there have been times when Wild Earth hasn't been brought. So I've been freelancing as a guide and back to Tanzania and in other parts of the private reserves here in South Africa. Prior to Wild Earth, funny enough, I was down in the Western Cape, if you know where that is, Kenneth. I was managing a little reserve down in the Western Cape. It was a retreat center. And that was a huge conservancy. And I'd been there just for a short while because I'd come back from East Africa. I'd been in Kenya, Tanzania for a while. And something made me want to come back to South Africa and, and spend time in the Cape because my family was there. And I guess I was hoping that being close to family I would get to see them more often and I also I, I was intrigued by the, the floral kingdom of the Cape I was there weren't that many large mammals as we have here but it was a run, wonderful reserve of the most diverse botanical species you could imagine second to the Amazon beautiful mountains overlooking the most beautiful bay that has some of the best whale watching in the world, in fact. Yeah. Southern right whales that come into the bay and you could sit on the rocks of the nearby shoreline and have whale tail flukes resting on the rocks 10 feet away. Uh, it was really cool. And I thought that I could spend some time with whales instead of elephants. this golden orb spider web stick around her. Maybe somebody else will do that or an elephant, but I don't want to do it. Oh, elephants have been passed here too. Um Yes, prior to being in the Cape, I was running camps and doing walking safaris in East Africa. Lisa on email wants to know how the sand feels under my feet. I love it. Not just the sand, Lisa. It's the whole package. It's the energy of not only the planet, but every living thing that I'm living with here. I can feel the energy of everything. Lions and elephants and all. It makes me part of it. It makes me feel part of it. It is my world that grounds me, it balances my, my energy, that kind of soft sand, flat sand, wonderful to walk on. It's like having reflexology done to a walking barefoot in the bush with the differences and the different sands and different plants. Different times of the year when things are wet and lush and green and soft like the carpet and the times in the dry season where things are harsh and dry and, and rough and sharp. happening on other, other lodges because all the other lodges are coming to see the Kuhumangala lock.
or Thank you, elephant, for leaving that in the road. Missed that big tree stump. Gets the heart beating a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> it's nice and calm and piece of wood, and it's like, ooh, when the heart goes, doof, 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 doof. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Hello, Kay. Nice to hear from you, Kay, in CA, California. EA. Have I ever used marula oil? I haven't, Kay. I have not had the chance to fund it anyway. But Kay is saying she's just paid $40 for a little bottle. Interesting. The boon track. This must be the true Gary Dam. They must have headed back to sojourn at Gary Dam last night. Forty dollars is four hundred fifty rand roughly. And I'm betting the little bottle is probably like about maybe. I mean it must be quite in uh, labors to extract marula oil so I can understand why it is an expensive oil and I'm sure it has some very amazing properties because it is such an intense oil but I'm afraid I'm going to be able to pay that kind of money for a bottle of oil that I don't know what to do with How you doing, Flick? Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Sometimes. No, these hellies, but... ...coming this way. Hello everyone. 
Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. I hope that's not going to happen again this evening. Closer to camp, I mean, off of that really off the road, that was the other road north, into those dips where it gets really, really difficult to broadcast from. But it's that time of day, time for sunset, and I have to admit defeat. At least I found Wild Dog Track. I think that concludes that mission. But for now, I don't need to be kicking myself that I couldn't find them because they weren't here to be found. So, that's a big accomplishment, I guess. And that means that Maybe tomorrow they'll come back again. Who knows? They're still in the area. Maybe they'll still be around. But for now, at least we know more or less where they are. The guys can no doubt follow up on that tomorrow. And so can we. And I failed with the elephants. I guess my belly radar is not working today so much. As much as it is that. Farming's been out. Elephant have been everywhere we've been, but we just haven't managed to farm it together. And so it comes the time of day when it's time to go back to what we do have and what we do know and what can actually be if some are some cats that are a little hungrier today than they were yesterday. Try and dangle Brian off of the vehicle and see. Does show any interest? Been that big bull we saw yesterday. Very fresh tracks though. Just head down this road a little way. to the lion.
maybe it'll be yeah. action tomorrow. What's that lovely sound of the woodlands kingfisher? There's three, four of them. Ring off. We're gonna miss that soon. It's gonna be gone. Heading back to the equator, heading back to Central Africa, Central East and West Africa. Anyway, such a clear sky, there's actually not much of a sunset, not much colour, other than a lovely afterglow. I did miss the actual sunset because we've been a little bit lower than the western ridge. Any stations? Mark here, can I join you? Oh, uh, sorry, wasn't aware there's a liner. Uh, not going to be possible. Yes, we're not going to see the lion after all. We're gonna have to go and find let's well we'll go up towards Zoe's road, go see if we can make those leopard tracks that we had. Evidently there are a bunch of vehicles that I think to come and see. I never have thought that it'd be so busy. But evidently it is. Um, June is normally pretty quiet, but there's not nothing happening on Arathusa and other lodges. So. Cedric. Nice this is an open lock. Alright, well we are going to the lock, he's leaving it with an open lock. I don't know, I don't understand the, the guy some.
maybe I misunderstood. I don't know if it is Cedric, not sure. Anyway, these cats might be waking up now. So the other thing we could have done is hyena den. in Wisconsin. Sue's asking if I talk about the wildlife. No, I don't, Sue. I don't have any qualifications to teach in this country. I guess since I don't have a piece of paper, I don't know enough. See cats?
Oh, he's growling at the male who came to sit close by and the young male and two other growling at them. Natalie in Florida, will the boys take the young male into their collision? Uh, not likely, I don't think that, but I don't think so. I think that would pose an inbreeding. They would then be liable to breed with his sisters. Time to follow. Very good timing. And I guess that Aristuza vehicle was, well, he might have said something that I didn't understand. I thought he said there well, are vehicles here and I was on second on the lineup and I must control the ability to control the lineup. It doesn't seem to be the lineup. Okay, well, okay. you're going to have to mind me because um, unless you get up now and you come along with us, I don't want to wait until you decide you finish rubbing your ear and then you're going to go sort of nonchalantly wander down to the dam. So, what figure? Come on, they're getting far ahead. You better catch up. I wonder if they're even going to go to the dam or if they're going to just go up to quarantine and go and catch something. And instead of having water, they're just going to have blood. Two, four, Six. Big males doing a lot of. Okay, you'll just have to catch up, dude. Come on, let's go. I'm just lying there. We're not going to the side. We're going to go to the side. Yeah, these girls are on the hunt. Look at this. This is not a, a posture and a this is this is about sitting out and looking for something to chase. When they're thirsty and they wake up and they're thirsty and they want to go to the water, then they're out of the water, but they spreading out, here's forward, they're looking to see what might be up ahead. And there are impala that are shouting at them. Looks like an aggressive facial gesture. Looks like a unhappy lion, but actually that is a very indeterminate. 
determining the hormonal status of a female. This is a magnificent lion. Where is brother? Are they? No, that's the youngster coming. We might see something because that male has stopped walking because the big male stopped walking. But we'll see what happens. Uh, and you see, now they've given, because their parlour have seen them, so it's not just a case of let's go down water. You're calling me, Tech? Uh, I don't know of, Angola starting to get mobile towards the dam. This young male is definitely keeping his distance from this big male, and this big male also was growling at him earlier. <laughs> Every time the big male stops, this youngster sort of... What is that game with you? And then you'd run towards them, and then as soon as they turn around, you had to stop. And if you were caught moving, you had to go to the beginning or something. Mm -hmm. I can't tell what it was called. Yeah. Hello, Chris. I think in North Carolina, if the male's finished mating with one female, oh look at that, he's scratching. If he's finished mating with, a, with, a, with this lioness and the lioness comes into estrus, will he mate with her? Well, he will. Yes, he will. And while we're here, big new moon, and yesterday was new moon, he's now just about to walk under the crescent moon with the beautiful, bright planet of Venus in the western sky. Just the new sliver of moon. I'll give it a few moments to get a bit darker, maybe. I think we missed one or two, they might still be behind us. I think there are a couple of them behind us, must be. Uh, if not him, Chris, then his brother. Um, if there's another female coming in two issues. whoever mentioned that red light green light or red rover I think remember it is sort of like a red light green light thing uh, this young male is definitely avoiding the big male watching him like a hawk so now seeing, I don't know, I'm still only seeing the two little ones Hello, little boy.
There are two adult males here, John. This is one in Connecticut. I don't know where the other one is. He might still be lying somewhere behind us. Many males are in this pride. Big male seems to want to go down to the water. None of them, are, none of the others do. Uh, there's another one at the water. Next nine. I think there's two missing. Uh, can we get two here? Hmm? I have no idea. Neither do I. I can't remember. One way to find out, I suppose. She's just she's inviting him. making a noise to the Yeah, a um, couple of them drinking. Um, they're all closer to four years now. They're on the and we catch the moon before it goes. The moon and Venus.
But it is going to be one of those evenings when we're just going to have to say goodbye. There's even a nicer picture. The moon. But let's just wait. Let's see if they're going to vocalize. Give it two minutes. Two minutes. Just masking for two minutes. Maybe. Ooh. Others are up here, just need of a these two, five, six, seven, one, going down to the water eight. And there's still a couple of them that haven't arrived here yet, they must be sleeping somewhere. She's Where are you going? Going to catch that because they're going to drink. Yeah, it's gonna chase it. It's gonna attack. <laughs> Somebody didn't, somebody wasn't too fond of being ambushed. Push her in the water. It's going to be one of those times when we're just going to have to say goodbye to them and goodbye to you. Look at that moon now. I just can't get enough of it. And we're going to be seeing it's going to be getting bigger and higher every day. Followed by Venus, the very bright Jupiter in the east. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on, please, catch before I say goodbye, it's the roar. Just a nice one here on the water because you've got all this water to amplify your sound. Come on to this. Give it a... Mm. Mm. You can face the other way. They can line with you if you face the other way. You gonna what? Face the other way, then we can have a line with you while you face and sign out. Okay. <laughs> Time has come. I guess we're going to have to say goodbye. So thanks for thanks for everything this afternoon. All the questions that you moon phase that only just started. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be watching how the moon grows and gets bigger and brightens up our sky at night. From myself, from all of these Kuluma lions, Brian on camera and Andrew back in final control. So we're going to leave these cats and. Uh, the Juma vehicles to come and enjoy them. So, on that note, from all of us at Wildest, love you lots. Goodbye. Take care.